up here to this microphone this time. I want to welcome you to First Baptist of Lexington. My name is Todd. I watch over the weekday ministries here. For those who may not know me, I'm kind of the stealth pastor who works mainly during the week. But I am very glad that you are here with us this morning. Just a couple of announcements to make sure that we're kind of on the same page. Um, we are a significant proponent of youth and children's ministry here at First Baptist, and that is made evident by our youth ministries, our children's ministry, as well as our summer camp and after school ministries. Um, so this week has been huge, and I don't know that you even know it, but uh, over this past week we've had 37 high school students, 21 middle school students, 24 elementary school students, and 106 summer camp students, all chasing God. And I'm talking summer camps all over the place, including the one that's here resident to our particular facilities. So I tell you that because I don't know if you went to summer camp as a kid, but you kind of get back on this spiritual high. And I say that carefully, but you get back and it's like, I'm on fire for God, let's go. And then what tends to happen is you get back into the, the ways of the world and everything begins to go away. So my request of you this morning is pick a group, pick some kids you see walking around here, or the elementary kids are not even back yet, they come back tomorrow, and pray for them. Not only because of the camp experience that they've had, but also because about two weeks from now, they're going back into school, and I think we all understand what kind of spiritual environment that represents. So pick a group, pick a kid, pick all of them. God understands their stories and their needs, and is just waiting on us as the church to step up to bat for them in their support and in their defense. Okay, we good on that? <laughs> All right, secondly, we do have missionaries for the week that I wanted to highlight very quickly. It is Bill and Mary Horton. And do you know what country they're from? Brazil, good. So a couple of you are seeing some of the different um, podcasts, not podcasts, but little videos that Paul puts on highlighting who they are and what they're doing. I would invite you to check those out on our Facebook page and various other places. Well, in Brazil, they were in charge of planting churches. They also did a camp ministry, kind of like what I watch over here at First Baptist. But as of right now, they are back stateside again, and they're living in Texas. And their goal now is not to kick back and just relax. Their goal is to seek out the Brazilian subculture that is part of the particular area of Texas they're in. So even though they are back stateside, they are still um, actively and aggressively trying to further the kingdom of God in terms of our Brazilian friends. So same thing, when you have your quiet time at night, because I know you have your quiet time, I'm hoping as I look all of you in your eyes, you and God are talking about our missionaries from Brazil. You and God are talking about our children and our youth as they get back from camp and they get set for school. So let's do that right now real quick. Father, we are grateful for the opportunity to gather here and to be able to listen to your word. And we are grateful to be able to come here and lay before you all the needs that we know of and even those we don't know about. And so we pray this morning over a vast array of children, Lord, who are from this church and many other churches who have been a part of camp over these past uh, two weeks or so. Praying, God, that the things that you have instilled in them, the changes that you have attempted to make would be long-lived. God, and that you would use us as a church and us as individual members of the church with a capital C to support and encourage and even challenge them as the newness of those things wear off. Lord, we pray over each of them for their protection, that you would guard their minds and their bodies. Lord, you would guard their very soul over these next weeks. We also thank you for the Hortons. Lord, and how they are making your name famous, whether it is over in Brazil or even in Texas, Lord, that you would give them all of the things they need. You would connect them with all the people they need to be connected with, that again, your kingdom would be advanced. We love you and we ask you to watch over this service. Take a seat here with us and just enjoy the worship, the praise, and your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. church. Why don't you stand with us and we're going to sing to the Lord this morning.
see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a path through. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, let's sing it out. So when I fight, I fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's nothing. You see the empty tomb. So when I fight, fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, that I belongs to you. Every fear I lay at your feet. I sing through the night. Oh. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Sing it. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. Sing through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Yeah, come on and praise the Lord today. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer as we go before the Lord? Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for everything that you bless us with and getting us here safely. Help us to never take a meeting like this for granted any Sunday morning. The freedom that we have to meet here. God, we give you our hearts today and we praise you for your mercy is more. It's your name we praise you and we give you this day. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more.
mighty acts of God continue. So last week we're in Acts 14, the ups and downs of ministry, the ups and downs of life. We talked about that. We talked about an identity not found in our experiences, our emotions, but it found in, in Christ. And today we find that this church and these apostles are not done with problems and trials and challenges. There are some problems arising in Acts chapter 15 we're about to address in a minute. But one of the things that amazes me as I look into the Bible is how relevant the principles of Scripture are to us. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, they might have been thousands of years ago. But God has placed this book in our hands with these experiences and these examples and inspired accounts of what took place so that we can learn. Because these guys had some challenges. Would you agree that we have lived in, especially in the last couple years, in a time of division in our country? We found that people more and more that used to be able to maybe talk about their differences and agree to disagree now, it's almost like uh, demonizing somebody, an enemy. And it's hard to have conversations. And uh, sometimes that spills over even maybe into some of your relationships at family gatherings or church. And there's things that maybe are not so essential, yet they've over time become like almost like gospel truths in, in certain subcultures. And today we're looking at, at a time when the disciples, the apostles, were having some false teaching coming in. They're going to kind of navigate this where the false teaching is that has really got to be addressed and where they can work together to bring peace and even a, a good compromise to living together and the Gentiles and the Jews as they're coming together. But I want to just say, first of all, that, you know, um, it's okay to have some differences of opinions on some things that are not essential things. In fact, I just want you to experiment for a minute. I want you to just Turn to the person next to you or somebody around you if, you, if you got somebody there. I want you to just find one thing you disagree on as quickly as possible. I want you to disagree on something. I mean, if you don't want to get into something too big, talk about, you know, your favorite sports or favorite food. Like, find something you disagree on. Find something real quick. At home, you can do this with somebody else in that room. <laughs> disagree on something quickly. So, um, so that didn't take too long. For those of you watching from home, they're, they're, they're all laughing while they're talking. So obviously it's nothing too tense out there. But I do want you to now find one thing you agree with the person that you were talking to. One thing you agree on. Find something really quick that you know you can agree on. Something important. All right. You found something? All right. How many of you said Jesus? All right. Some of you agreed on Jesus. That's good. That'll pull us together, right? No matter what. What divides you? We got Jesus. <laughs> Some of you might have been the Gamecocks and it wasn't quite as spiritual, but that's okay. <laughs> but there's times when you disagree on things and what's, what's really essential, what's one thing we've got to stand on, and what are things that we can agree to disagree on. And I think we'll find that a little bit in even how they reconcile that and have peace. So today it's about grace, grace. Now, everybody loves grace. At least we like grace for us, right? You like to have grace shown towards you. You like the grace that saved you. You love the grace that people give to you when you mess up and you got to ask forgiveness. That grace is great. We, all, we don't always like giving grace as much to other people that have let us down and hurt us, but we like receiving grace. Most people like that word. Today, it's a whole lot about grace. The first is a grace that saves sinners. Okay, this grace that we see in here, and this is the context. We're going to start, we're not reading every verse in this chapter, but we're going to read some key verses. Acts 15, verses 1 and 2. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers, and this is what they're teaching them, unless you're circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, where some of this tension was happening and coming from, send them to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. So here is the problem. The falsehood is being stated that unless you fit into our law, circumcision, the Jewish identity, these customs that were passed down from 
Moses and Abraham that they were asked to do as a testimony. Yes, it was given for a reason, but also as a part of the reason was to show them what they cannot do in their own strength. But now they're expecting now all these people, we're going to make all the Gentiles converting who are not from our background. They're going to have to follow this, and they're going to all get circumcised. They're going to have to, and these laws, they're going to pile on these laws. Now, maybe some of you grew up like I did. I grew up in a in a church environment that was we would call legalistic, um, fundamentalist. Now, you know, the word fundamentalist um, at some point was a good word because it actually meant we're sticking with the fundamentals, right? Jesus died for our sins. The Bible's God's word. Uh, we are saved through faith, and that was the fundamentals. Along the way, fundamental included a, lot, a whole lot of other things that weren't really the fundamentals. And I remember when I was, when I was in that environment, like hiding my CDs, you know? I don't want anybody to see my CDs. Now, some of you are going, whoa, what kind of CDs does Paul listen to? No, I mean, the, I'm, I'm just in case you're wondering, these CDs I'm talking about with Sandy Patty, and some of you older people know I'm talking about, and Petra. I mean, these are great Christian artists, but I'm like, some people are like, those are, you know, that's the, the devil's beat, or whatever reason you can't listen to that. So there was these, this was the environment that I grew up in. So there's a whole lot of things added to what spirituality was. They might not have said it was to get saved, but it's like, if you are saved, you're not going to do this. You're not going to look like that. You're not going to dress that way. You're going to dress this way. You're not going to listen to this. You're going to listen to that. Uh, a whole lot of things. You know, you don't go to movies. There's a whole lot of rules. A few of you know what I'm talking about. There's a few of you that you, 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 you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, today we might not have that, but there's a whole lot of other things culturally that in subcultures within Christian churches, sometimes you add things. There's political things. You're expected to believe this and believe that and fit into this subculture or else there's something wrong with you or you're not part of you know, so there's these things that get added to what God really wanted us to focus on. Church, what does he want us to focus on? Church, what is the essential that God says, this is what I want you united on. This is what I want you about. We find it in verses 10 and 11. It says, so why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentiles with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way. What was that? Was there a list here? We're saved this way by the undeserved grace of our Lord Jesus. I got saved because I knew I couldn't get saved by being good enough. I didn't get saved by a list of rules or certain things. You know, there's basically two types of religion in the world, and this includes all the Christian denominations all the non-Christian denominations, there's basically two types of religion. There's a religion that says you got to work at it, you got to do certain things, you got to measure up to certain expectations, and these are the things that if you do this and you work hard enough, maybe you'll get there. When I was observing for a class of cultural anthropology where I had to go observe another uh, setting, environment, culture, I remember talking to a rabbi, and unfortunately it was so sad when I asked him for my, I was asking him, how do you believe in your religion a person can know that they're going to go to heaven? He said, well, we believe that's presumptuous to ever know that you can be forgiven until you get to the next life. That's sad, but that's where, and some Christians fall there too. It's like, well, we're going to do our best. Somehow we're going to hope we measure up, hope we really do enough, add enough onto this list, and, and maybe if we, if we are, somehow we're going to get there. And the other side is the one that says, I can never earn my way. It's through faith, it's grace, a Savior that came, and I trust him to forgive my sins, and that's the only way I can get there. So it's, it's one way or the other. But this, these apostles are getting back to this is the gospel. It's not all those other things that's trappings of, of circumcision and the law of Moses and things that were not bad things. Some of these things were good ways for you to live, and Moses gave you these things, but to tell people that that's how you're going to get saved and you have to do all those things and throwing this on them when you couldn't even follow all those things is now. And they argued vehemently against this. Now today I want you to know that we need to argue vehemently for the gospel truth. But then as these apostles said as an example, we're to pursue passionately peace and it's not an either or. It's not, I'm going to either stand for truth or I'm going to stand for peace with people. He says, you can do, but you can stand on truth and you can also pursue with passion what needs to happen because there is a division happening. There's people getting 
uh, all these things required of them, people getting overwhelmed, people being put a legalistic burden on them, and we have a problem. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So no one of us can boast about it. They had this idea that they were supposed to live up to a certain standard to somehow, and they were adding to it, no, stand on the truth of the gospel. There's Jesus, salvation, grace, nothing more, nothing less. That's what saves you. And so the apostles are standing firm on the grace that saves sinners. In fact, there's another situation. It could have been a different time. Some people think it may have been a similar time, but Paul actually had to talk to Peter about this when he was getting a little bit hypocritical. Galatians 2, 11 to 16. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, Paul said. For what he did was very wrong. Well, what did he do? When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised, which he was definitely supposed to do. But afterward, when some friends of James came, this is from Jerusalem, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Hmm. When I saw that, that they were not following the truth of the gospel, standing for the truth of the gospel, they're trying to add to the gospel, they're trying to... Uh, they're being hypocritical here. I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, I mean, you've, you're living in grace, you've given up all that legalism for yourself, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth and quote-unquote sinners like the Gentiles, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we've obeyed the law, for no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. We are saved by what? Grace. Grace alone. Don't add to it. Don't be a hypocrite, Peter. And Peter learned from it. And they all are on the same page when we get to chapter 15. They're all talking through. You see Peter talking to them. You see Paul talking to them. You see James. They're all coming together. We're going to see how they deal with some of this. But grace has to be the foundation. We are saved by grace. We're saved by grace, and now we can live by grace and show grace. Philip Yancey says, only by living in the stream of God's grace will I find the strength to respond with grace to others. Isn't it strange somehow when you run into Christians who they say they're saved by grace, they say they believe in grace, and then they can be the most hateful and difficult and challenging and die on all these other hills and get in arguments about everything else? We are saved by grace to live by grace, to show grace, to be the stream of grace where God's grace flows through us as instruments of grace. So, so we're saved. Grace to save sinners. This is very important, and this is established. Now we want to talk about the problem and grace that seeks relationship. Because there's a whole lot of ways this could have been handled. There's some things the guys didn't do. We'll talk about that in a minute. But here's what they do. Uh, verses 4 to 7, we'll get started. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Barnabas and Paul were welcomed by the whole church including the apostles and elders. They reported everything God had done through them. But then some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and insisted the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. They interrupted this celebration of unity and what God's done with their legalism and their demands. So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them as follows. Brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. Now, I want you to notice some things they did not do, and we'll talk about what they did. They did not deny the problem. You know, when there's a conflict going on, there's people that, that are either speaking something that's not true or there's something that people are disagreeing on. 
they did not deny the problem. Some people want to avoid the issue, right? Some of you do, right? I mean, some of us are more avoiders than others, but let's just deny what problem. What are you talking about? You know, and we act like there is no problem. They did not deny the problem. They did not go, it's your problem. They did not deny it. Also, we, we see they did not dilute the truth. We, they already covered the truth, right? They did not deny the problem. Secondly, they did not dilute the truth. And then third, very importantly, they did not demonize their opponents. They did not demonize their opponents. Disagree with you. You, you didn't give me respect, so I'm going to lay into you and, and talk down to you and verbally attack you. They did not do that. They did not deny the problem. They did not dilute the truth. They did not demonize their opponents. And they did not demand their own preferences. They will, you'll see that as they work through these differences that are not theological necessarily, but that are more preferences based on the culture, they begin to work through an agreement to handle those sensitive issues without demanding their preferences. Put another way, another way, we could say some people avoid, some people appease, some people attack, and some people address the problem. These guys decided to address the problem. They decided to deal with it. In verse 6, it says, So the apostles and elders met together to resolve this issue. They met together with a purpose, not to pretend like there was no problem, but to deal with the problem. They resolve the issue. And here's the thing. Grace, that li living out that grace, grace seeks to resolve problems between people. Grace seeks to resolve problems that can be addressed. Grace seeks to resolve issues. Also, grace takes time to listen to others. Look at this next part, and some of this I'm repeating, but it says, at the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood and addressed them. Now, some people, they'll state their opinion, and it's, I told you, end of discussion, right? I told you my opinion, we're done. But they had a long discussion. They were willing, this relationship, these relationships, this unity in this body is so important that even if it takes all day, even if it takes a long discussion, I, we're going to discuss. A discussion is both directions, right? It's not one way. We're going to discuss. You want to resolve something with somebody? You've got to listen to that person. You have a discussion. You don't make demands. You listen. Listen to them. And it goes on and says, Brothers, you know all that God chose me from among you some time ago. Let's go down to verse 12. Everyone listened quietly as Barnabas and Paul told about the miraculous signs and wonders God had done through the, them among the Gentiles. Listen carefully. You know, listening is hard. In our Celebrate Recovery meetings, we have a rule that when somebody's speaking, there's three to five minutes, they get time to speak, nobody interrupts them, there's no crosstalk, no interruption. One of the leaders recently at the summit said, he really likes that because he never gets three to five minutes at home like that. <laughs> and he made a joke about it. But three to five minutes, you get to talk, nobody interrupts you, you get to share where you're at, how you're doing, and, and, and sometimes that's easy for some people, hard for others to, to be able to share the reality where they are and be honest about it. But these guys are listening to where somebody else is at. Because this is the way I would put it. If you don't listen without lecturing, you may lose without learning. If you don't listen without lecturing, you may lose without learning. See, if I could go back and, and reparent my kids, and I love my kids, I think they turned out great. But if I could go back and do something better and different, I would lecture less and I would listen more. I don't know about you, but, but most, and, and probably the young people, were, they're going to be nodding their heads here. But most of the time, if you, if you start lecturing, lecturing somebody, it's not like they're going to go, oh, thanks for explaining that to me, Mom, Dad. Now I get it. You know? If you have a consequence, just go to the consequence, love them and tell them, sorry, I'm the parent, this is the consequence, I love you, I know you don't get it, but that's okay. Lecturing doesn't work. But listening might help. You do the listening to them. So why were you out late? And what, are, what kind of friends do you have right now? And, and how, how are you feeling about our relationship? And listen, right? That's, that's parenting. That's also, that's also a relationship with friends or spouses is I got to listen more and talk less, right? The best, the key to communication is not how well you talk. It's how well you listen. 
Am I listening? And, uh, and, and I'm not talking about listening to then respond, right? Because sometimes we're listening to where, okay, I'm working on my rebuttal here. Based on what you said, here's how I'm going to come back. And we don't listen to understand. We listen to rebut the issue, right, to come back. No, we have to listen to understand. Let me seek more to understand than to be understood, St. Francis of Assisi prayed. So listening without lecturing is important. Listening without le- uh, labeling. Some people might listen and then they start labeling. Well, you're this and you're that. If you want to resolve issues with grace, listen well. Without lecturing, without labeling. Listen with love to find out. They listened. They had a long discussion because it took a long time for everybody to have their three to five minutes or whatever they had to share your opinion, share where you're at, share what you need everybody else to know about why this is important to you, how you're feeling. They had this because relationship, grace in relationship says it's important enough, it's important to you, it's important to me. We're going to pursue passionately the relationship and resolution in that. Grace takes time to listen to others. Grace also looks through God's eyes. Verses 8 and 9 said God knows people's hearts, and he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. Nobody is better because they're in this cultural identity, because they come from this cultural background, because they're of this socioeconomic status, because they have these issues, don't have these issues, but they have these issues, right? We look at people with degrees sometimes in all that human way, but God looks at us all as separated from him and needing grace and healing and salvation, and that's how God looks at us. And we're to look at people through God's eyes. When Jesus saw went to see the Samaritan woman. He went purposefully. He knew she's not coming to me. He went to her alone, isolated, put down, living in shame. He went to where she was and loved her there. Look at people through God's eyes, and you will look at people through eyes of grace. Mary Magdalene. Zacchaeus, the people that others had discarded, the people that others had demonized, the people that others had pulled away from Jesus, went after them. Grace seeks relationship. Grace seeks to listen. Grace seeks to care for others. Grace sees people through God's eyes. And yes, grace stands on truth. We get back to that in verses 13 to 18. When they finished, James stood and said, Brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about this time God first visited the Gentiles to take from them people for himself. And this conversion of Gentiles is exactly what the prophets predicted. As it's written, afterward, I'll return and restore the fallen house of David. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it so that the rest of humanity might seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, all those I've called to be mine. The Lord has spoken. He who has made these things known so long ago. I think the Jews kind of had this fear. We're losing our identity. We're losing our Jewishness. We're losing to these other people coming into the body. And pretty soon, you know, we're going to be just like everybody else. Well, James reminds them that was God's plan, that the nations would come together, that people would be saved through the gospel, that we would become one. That was the plan, James says. Let me help you stand on the truth here. I'm going to hear your concerns, and we're going to have a long discussion, but I'm going to take you back to one thing here, that grace is to save all sinners. And God wants to bring people together. And so they bring that back and stand on truth. Also, grace considers others. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Now, some of the Gentiles turning to God did need to make some adjustments. We're going to see a little bit about that in a minute. But he says, listen, guys, we're not going to make it more difficult because we care about them. We're not going to overwhelm them. We're not going to discourage them. We're not going to turn them into us because they're not. We're going to love them where they're at. We're going to consider them where they're at. Philippians 2, 3, Jesus said that we're to honor others, to consider others, humbly consider others better than ourselves hold them up, consider others with the differences. Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. 
Opportunity what? Opportunity to show Jesus. Opportunity to show grace. Opportunity to show Him. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. He doesn't say, you just give them the truth and it doesn't matter how. No, no, you speak attractively, graciously. In the old King James, it says to let your speech be seasoned with salt. Food tastes a lot better with salt on it, doesn't it? You ever tried french fries without salt? I mean, salt just adds to that. Let your speech be gracious, attractive, to pull people towards you, to let people know you love them and care about them. By the way you talk, your speech is going to be gracious and grace-filled if you're following Jesus, not just saved by grace, but living by grace. May your words be grace-filled. And as we stand on truth, we consider others, not making it too difficult adding to the gospel, adding to a bunch of rules that may be unnecessary. But here's the problem. There's still an issue. Grace needs to surrender some rights here because there's some people in this group that are saying, these issues offend me, and these issues are causing me or somebody in my family to end up sinning against God because of their conscience. And these people are going, well, I got the freedom, I got the liberty. They say, yeah, but this is something that we've got to work together in unity. We've established that salvation is based on grace alone. Grace is all that saves sinners. Grace alone, faith alone. But now we're going to get along with some people that might have differences. How are we going to handle those things? Verses 28 to 31 after they've talked, after they've listened, after they've considered all the sides, after they've worked, how can we go forth in unity? How can we go from division to unity? How can we live together in unity when we have these different backgrounds? For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us to lay no greater burden on you than these few requirements. Let's keep it as simple as possible. You must abstain from eating food offered to idols, from consuming blood of the meat of strangled animals and from sexual immorality. If you do this, you will do well. Farewell. Now, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute, but for, for them, it's like, phew. I mean, these guys are saying, we've got to get circumcised. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. It's like, okay. But there's still a few things here. They're like, you know, just because you're saved doesn't mean you can go do whatever you feel like. Now, now you need to consider the unity of the body. And some of you are coming from backgrounds where idols were a real thing. Now, others of you are going, idols don't, there's, they're not a real thing. Something offered to idol, there's nothing evil about that. I mean, an idol's just something somebody made, right? They say, no, 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 no somebody else, this is, this is a real thing, and there's, there's a demon in there, this is bad. And so, so Paul actually addresses this whole thing about in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, Now regarding your question about food that's been offered idols, yes, we know that we all have knowledge about this issue. Yeah, we all have an opinion. We all think we know. I mean, talk about today's culture, right? I have my knowledge. You have your knowledge. We all think we know why we're right. So you think you have knowledge. We all have knowledge about this issue, you, you know, why, why you believe what you do. But while knowledge makes us feel important, <laughs> look what I know. I know the latest research. You don't. While knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. You want a church to be unified? You want a church to be built up? It's not going to be like, let, let's, let's all make sure we are all right on every little thing. And we all agree with me on every little thing. We've established the essentials. Now, on some other things, let's love be what brings us together, even if it means surrendering some of my thoughts and ideas, keeping my mouth shut sometimes for the sake of unity. Let me seek unity because it is love that strengthens the church. That was verse 1. And then it says, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't know very much. I just love that. You know anybody who claims to know? No, 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 don't, don't raise your hand. And who claims to know all the answers? Okay, because they don't know very much. It's like they say when you go to college, a freshman goes in thinking you, you know, I don't know much. Sophomore thinks they, they, they know everything, the wise fool. The junior begins to realize maybe I don't know everything, and the, and the senior getting ready to graduate goes, boy, there's a lot I don't know. You know you, the more you learn, the more you know you don't know everything, and the more humble you get as you study 
answers. But here we go. But the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes. Love. That lasts. So we also see in Romans 14, talking about being, oh, but actually, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. Abstaining from food offered to idols, that was the one thing. It also says the blood, strangled animals, sexual immorality. Let's just talk about those three things they said would be important to do. Because they received it well, because this was like a compromise. The reason it was because some of them were saying, you got to do a whole zillion things. And others were saying, we're saved by grace, so none of these things matter. They, none of those things are going to save you, but guess what? Some of those things are going to maintain unity in the body. Some of those things are going to bring peace in the body. And, and sexual immorality, well, that one goes all the way back to the Old Testament. And God said, a man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, they'll become one flesh in marriage. That's where sex is reserved for marriage. First Corinthians 7, Paul says, uh, he says, hey, if, if you're having trouble with sexual urges, he didn't say go find somebody and live with them. He said get married, right? I mean, that hasn't changed. That's the Bible. So sexual, that's important that we recognize that we can't water that down. That's what God said. This is how it's meant to be because this is all. So we're going to stand on that, so no, no sexual immorality. And, then, and the food offered to idols, that's kind of a, okay, that, that's a thing where some of them said that they, they mean, this means something, and that's going to offend somebody else. They're going to think there's something to that food, even though Paul said it really isn't. But we're going to respect that and not cause somebody to stumble over that. And then what's with the blood? Well, they, they, the, the pagan custom back then, they would take blood and they would, make, they would drink blood as part of a blood sacrifice. So we don't want to get into those pagan customs, even though, there's, they, even though now all the things are, came down on that sheet, Peter saw it all, but he still says, no, this is one thing. That's a pagan thing. This is an offensive thing, and this is a universal thing. So there's several things. He said, there's certain things that, you know what, the Bible's pretty clear on. There's no debating it. Let's live by that, right? Let's just do it. There's some things we know that those things, you know what, in the, in the culture that we live in, that, that may be offensive to some people, may hurt some people, let's, and they may cause somebody to sin. Let's not do that. There's some things that are going to be triggers for people that associate with pagan customs. Let's not do that. You know, I had a, a pastor I know who was a recovering, or he is a recovering alcoholic, and after a while, he hadn't drank for years and years, and he was doing so well, and then some, some of his Christian friends uh, drank, and he was like, well, maybe it's okay now. I'm going to drink again. And this recovering alcoholic pastor relapsed. Had to go back, take a sabbatical back for months of recovery before he could get back into ministry, because some of his believing friends, even though they knew he was an alcoholic, told him, ah, just a little bit, this is okay, and they urged it on him. And he relapsed, because somebody wasn't thinking about the, the unity and the concern and the triggers for this person. And that's why Paul says in Romans 14, don't tear apart the work of God over what you eat. Remember, all foods are acceptable, but it's wrong to eat something if it makes another person stumble it's better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else if it might cause another believer to stumble. He's saying, I want the kingdom of God more than my personal preferences. I want the kingdom. I will submit my rights. I will submit what I can stand on. Americans, we're big on rights, right? But I will surrender whatever I need to to build unity and peace, and I will work together to have a body that reflects that. Standing on the essentials, the gospel truth, living out what's clear in Scripture as moral teachings and also being willing to hold back and surrender those areas of my allowances or preferences to give you and me a unity and to keep you from sinning or falling backwards. In closing, grace gets you from lost to saved, from apart to redeemed, from lost without hope, how do I get to heaven? How do I get forgiven? To a place of redeemed in relationship with Christ. Grace gets me from division and conflict to unity and joy. That's what happened. This chapter started with division, conflict, confusion, disagreement, dissension, heartache. It was awful. But at the end, in verses, uh, I didn't read that part before, verses 30 and 31, the messengers went at once to Antioch when they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter, and there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. 
You know, um, we all live in different cultures. I grew up in a different culture. I've lived here a while. But I lived in Japan for many years. In Japan, you go to somebody's house, you take off your shoes, front. You would never walk in. That would be dirty. That would be disrespectful. You do not walk in with shoes. You actually put on slippers. Then when you get to the bathroom, you take off those slippers, and the bathroom has special bathroom slippers because bathrooms can be dirty. So you do not walk out with your bathroom slippers. On more than one occasion, myself or somebody I knew would forget and walk out of the bathroom with the bathroom slippers, and people's eyes would get big, and they would point very politely, you've got the bathroom slippers on. I want to suggest to you that as a good guest, if any of you ever goes to Japan, please do not go in with your shoes on. Please do not wear the bathroom slippers out into the rest of the house and dirty up the house. But can I ask you, as brothers and sisters, would you show just as much respect to a brother or sister who has a problem with alcohol, who has a problem with something else in their life, who has a political disagreement with you? Can you keep your mouth shut? Can you strive for unity and joy and give up your personal rights for the sake of unity and respect? That's what grace does. Saved by grace, now live by grace. Let's pray. Lord, help us to live graciously, lovingly, with your eyes. Help us to be willing to let go of our personal preferences when needed, yet stand for the truth of the gospel that nothing else saves us. Nothing else needs to be added or taken away. The truth of salvation, but also may we live out that grace day to day, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a short invitation. You can stand while they're singing this song, and if God's put anything on your heart to surrender, come down, pray. Give it to him. Or if you don't know, if you have a relationship with this God, this gospel, this transforming grace, we're up here, several of us, and would love to talk to you. Pray with you. Let's sing. God is able, He will never fail, He is almighty God, greater than all we see, greater than all we ask, He has done great things, lift it up, lift it up, He defeated the grave. Race to life, our God is able. In His name, we overcome. For the Lord, our God is able. And He's with us. God is with us, God is on our side, He will make a way, far above all we know, far above all we hope, He has done great things, lifted up. to life our God is able in his name we overcome for the Lord our God is able lift it up lift it up he defeated the grave raised to
you to have a seat just for a moment. Something personal. I need to ask for a little grace. Um, two years ago, I found out that I have prostate cancer, and my dad had prostate cancer, and so anyhow, genetics uh, caught up with me. But um, you say, two years ago, why haven't you done anything? Because mine was a little marginal. Uh, on a Gleason score, you that are nurses or doctors, I was a six. And seven or more, you got to do something. Six, you can just watch it carefully and go that path because um, some of uh, this cancer grows slow, uh, is what I've understood. Anyway, long story short, but my PSA, which is a score that indicates cancer growing in the prostate, has kind of gone up, went back, went up, went back, and it's gone up again. So I feel like um, to be wise and not let the you know, horse out of the barn, I need to take care of this now before the cancer gets outside the prostate. So um, I waited to tell you because uh, I knew everybody's going to tell me what to do, <laughs> which I already had some people in the first service, but I've already committed. I'm going to Jacksonville, Florida. There's a place called Turk Oncology, and I know there's lots of different ways of treating it, and I'm not saying this is the best. This is just what I feel comfortable doing. Others of you that I've talked to you have gone other routes, and it's worked for you. I get it. But anyway, I'm going to go there. Um, uh, Wednesday, I have a consult. Uh, I got to get prepped on Thursday. I start everything the following Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday. The good news is they say that I'm a good candidate for fast track. They can treat this, they think, with a little higher dosage. I'm probably naive in thinking I'm going to bounce right back. But um, anyway, I'm hoping I will. Um, but I'm going to be a little bit out of pocket for a little bit. But we've got some capable leaders uh, here in our church, and uh, that'll be kind of stepping in for me. And so, thus in August, you, you'll get a variety of preachers. So, you know, where can you go? What church can you go to and not have to hear the same guy every Sunday? Uh, so, you'll get to hear our high school pastor, Griffin, and our middle school pastor, Kevin. And Todd's going to help us next week, though we have a, a special guest coming with communion and a devotion. And Pastor Jonathan, our Connect pastor. And anyway, Paul uh, stepped in the last two weeks. So, I just want you to know, um, I'm not dying. I'm not like uh, some of people in our church have gone through serious radiation, chemo, and things like that, which is very debilitating. This is not that, okay? This is a very precise um, treatment, and Turk Oncology, the reason I picked them is because they've become known for their ability to treat this. And so, anyhow, Melissa and I will be heading to Jacksonville, Florida for a couple weeks, and then um, I'll be back and hopefully back in the saddle soon. And so don't let anybody move in my office. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, so uh, I'm, not, I'm not checking out on you. I just want you to pray for me, okay? And so you know what's going on, and when you come, you're like, where's, where's the old man? Anyway, just get, getting a little uh, help with my health, okay? But I'm good, and uh, we're going to hit this thing. God's got it. And Craig's one of our uh, deacons, co-chairs, and I know that uh, they requested, and I appreciate a, a time of prayer for me. Pastor has asked for our prayer, and we want to begin it, begin that right now. So deacons and uh, yoke fellows, uh, other ordained men, if you would please come down and join us as we lay hands on uh, Pastor Ralph and congregation. Um, you're welcome to join us here as well if you want to lay your hands on the shoulder of one of these men here, or you can stay where you are. Uh, but we do want to have a word of prayer together as a church. And here's how I'd like to do that. Um, let's start with uh, you praying audibly, um, but softly, your prayer over Brother Ralph. And then I'll uh, summarize that and close the prayer. So let's pray. thank you for this uh, for this beautiful time of, of voices being lifted up to you individually but Lord being lifted up in unison you told us when two or three of us are to, together you're with us 
And Lord, we've now got a couple hundred here together in one purpose for one point. And that's the healing of our pastor, the healing of our leader. So, Lord, we ask that you be with doctors as they work through tests this week. Give them clarity on treatment. Be with everybody involved in the treatment team. And, Lord, as the procedure's being done, guide every step. Be in their eyes. Be in their hands. Give them precision in what they're doing. And, Lord, then give healing as only you can give. Bring your brother, our brother, back to full strength. We need him. We depend on him. And we work with him. And Lord, uh, just touch him in a special way. Thank you, Lord. Bless him. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I'll leave you with the words of Jesus. I'll be back. <laughs> Have a great day.